the common denominator of all closings is a real conversation. Tell me one closing that's happened without real conversation. None. Nada. What, what advice would you give to, uh, you know, agents who has fears of really just picking up the phone and making phone calls consistently? I hear uh, a lot of agents say, too, as far as, uh, hey, well, I can I can just, you know, put posts on social media. I can do Facebook lives, Instagram lives or just do other type of uh, reposts from other agents right. on, on social media. Two things. One, look at the specific agent that told you that and go to MLS and pull up their sales and see how impressed you are. Number one. Okay. Number two, if that person really is working social media the way they should be working social media and grabbing the data, what are we going to do with that data? We're going to call those leads between nine and 12 every day. Listen, guys, here's something you should really stick with you today. The common denominator of all closings is a real conversation. Tell me one closing that's happened without real conversation. None. Nada. So so if that's the common denominator, okay, let's reverse engineer as many closings as we can possibly have. Because remember, it's unlimited. So if we want to have the, the maximum amount of closings that we can have personally, then we have to have as many real conversations as we as we can humanly possibly have. That's the key to having as many closings as you can as you can have. That's what that's the key to reaching your full potential right there, right? Whoever has the most conversations, because that's the common denominator, because it doesn't matter where you get your leads from. From. Zillow, Facebook, open houses, sphere of influence. I don't know where you get them from, right? It comes right back to what? Calling them. Gotta call them, see how they're doing, see what's up, see what we could do to help. What are they looking to do? Why are they looking to do it? Okay, if that's the case, here's what we should do. As the professional, here's what we should do. Here's what I think we should do. Here's my consultation to you about a game plan moving forward based on what you want to do, why you want to do it, and when you want to do it. That's what you got to learn from people when they're looking to buy or sell something. What? when and why based on all that then as a professional agent this is our job it's what we use our use our career as a platform and a vehicle to help people so we're just out there scrounging around just beating the bushes trying to talk to as many people as you can to see who needs our help today oh you oh you thinking of doing, doing something let me see if i can help you okay tell me the situation why are you looking to do it when are you looking to do it and and what are you looking to do okay is there an agent you're already working with on that cool well listen based on all that here's what i think we should do moving forward i'm gonna send you some properties i'll text you when i send it i'll call you tomorrow see what you thought let's go look maybe i should come by and take a look at your house and see what it's worth so we can try to figure figure out what angle we want to take and every situation is different. That's why I hate a lot of these coaching programs that talk about this is how you follow up. You follow up exactly the same way every single lead. How can that be? Every situation is different. Everybody has different motivations and reasons and what they want to do and why they want to do it. You have to custom build a game plan, a follow up game plan for every prospect. If you want to be a professional, it's like a doctor, right? It's like a doctor giving a surgery. Do you just come into a walk in clinic and they just take you back and just put you to sleep and cut you open? No, they come in and you have a consultation. You talk about what's going on. It's the same thing with real estate agents. We got to know everything going on. We got to run some tests. We got to look at the data. And then once we have everything we need, now let's create a game plan. How do you, when you're juggling, we're not juggling. I know you're saying you got nine to 12. You still have personal life and all that. How do you maintain that level of that level without getting tired? Or even when you do get tired, how do you keep yourself motivated and going? The reason I think they get burnt out is because they're going too long in the day, right? They're going to like six, seven, eight nine o'clock and their their mind is just literally shot the next morning right they're just and you can't keep that up so i so i believe in five six o'clock i'm done i'm recharging the rest of the afternoon just chilling like going to vacation mode you know when you go on vacation you're just not worried about work you come back and you're like recharged and on fire that's what you need to do every day like at five o'clock now you're on pretend like you're on vacation at the house you're doing all the stuff that you would do if you were just on vacation you know or you're chilling with the family or you're watching a movie or you're literally completely relaxing. Now, if you got to show property, that's different, but that doesn't happen every evening. Okay. A lot of people say that, oh, you show property. Hey, how you do? No, it doesn't happen every day. If it happens here and there, yeah, I'll go show property. I mean, that's, that's fine. As far as like a routine, I get up at four 30, which is probably extreme, but by eight o'clock, I go through the same stuff. I just told you guys a while ago. And then by five, six o'clock, I'm totally done. I'm just relaxing.
Yes. And, and you, you have to get into this. It's all about pacing yourself where you can, because like I could go till midnight every night and really like crush some stuff between like six and midnight. Dude, I could complete like it would be a whole different level. But how long could I keep that up, you know, before I just completely crashed? And so, yeah, I could be doing more on a daily basis because I do stop at five, but I can maintain this pace for years and years and years. That's the difference. And so a lot of people, they go through these ups and downs where they get real excited and they're probably producing more than me for a couple weeks, maybe even a couple months, but then they don't get the results they want or they're working too hard and they start getting burnt out and then they start coming down and then they literally don't produce anything for like two or three months and I won't hear from them. I'm like, what happened? You know, well, I've been kind of feeling down and this, I was like, man, you were on fire two months ago. You were crushing me two months ago, you know, but see, I've, I've got to the point where I'm just steady. It's like a turtle, you know, the tortoise in the hair. I'm just steady as she goes and we'll see who wins kind of deal. Nobody can outpace me. You might be able to outwork me in one day or even six months, but can you keep that up for decades? But as far as, uh, you know, for agents who struggling, like in this market, you know, who's trying to transition from normally like working a lot of buyers to trying yeah. to get listings, like what would be your advice on that to, uh, to kind of help change the mindset of agents who is kind of just getting frustrated because, you know, working with buyers, you can't find them nothing like right now. So what else can I be doing to still try to close deals and, and help people, you know, with transactions? What, what would be your advice on that? Well, the thing is, is that it is hard right now, especially for new agents. That's kind of how I started out the meeting. And here, here's at the end of the day, when you talk to a buyer and seller and say, hey, how'd you pick your agent, right? The most common answer is going to be, I had a friend in the business. Before internet, that's kind of what it was. And the internet came along and then it was like, people were picking their agents online. We went through that phase. Now we're entering into this next phase of the cycle where people are leaning back towards wanting to know their agent before dealing with them because they've had bad experiences just picking an agent online. So now we're right back to what, who has the relationship in place and they're going to go to their trusted agent to help them through the transaction. And that's just going to continue to be a, a trend that continues to, to move upward. And so if that's the case, let's put it all together, right? If the fact is that people, especially sellers, are choosing their agent because that's who they feel like is their friend. And then the common denominator of all closings is a conversation, a real conversation. Let's put all that together. Let's have real conversations with the most sellers to just to make friends, just to make friends, not even to try to sell them anything. Let's just make friends in the market, collect that data, start sending them info on us on a weekly basis, let them get to know us through the email, and then uh, let the chips fall where they fall kind of deal. Right now it's tough because so few people are listing because they can't buy anything, so they don't want to sell. They don't want to miss out. They feel like the market's going up. Why would I sell now? I'm going to leave money on the table. It's tough right now for newer agents to get listings. So you're kind of forced to work with buyers as a new agent. And then you're in this situation where you're competing against 15 buyers. So it's tough for new agents. I would say just focus on database growth. Can we add five a day? Can we add a hundred a month? Can we add 1200 in a year and not care about income right now? Right. And if you do that, you're going to do some deals here and there and squeeze by. And if you squeeze by and you end up squeezing by with a massive database over the next 12 months, then you win because when the market flips, you're going to have all the listings.